Hello everyone, welcome to Bajra YAS Academy, the Hindu News Analysis. Today is 12th July 2024 and today we have few important articles for the discussion. So without any delay, let's start our discussion and before discussing them, let's try to solve yesterday given practice question. So yesterday I have given one practice question regarding Shanghai Cooperation Organization and we very often discussed about this Shanghai Cooperation Organization when it was established, uh, which are the countries, are the member countries of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and what are the objectives of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Now, everything we have discussed in a very detailed manner in our previous lectures so this is also a very simple question with respect to the members of the shanghai cooperation organization the question is which of the following countries are the members of the shanghai cooperation organization right so if you look at uh, these member countries uzbekistan kajikistan iraq russia bangladesh and turkmenistan so it is very clear that bangladesh is not a member country of the shanghai cooperation organization because in south asia only india and pakistan are actually the members of the shanghai cooperation organization so you can uh, eliminate bangladesh from this option because bangladesh is not a member country and apart from that the other thing that you need to understand iraq is also not a member country of the shanghai cooperation organization and even turkmenistan even though it is part of the central asia turkmenistan is also not part of the shanghai cooperation organization so if you exclude iran bangladesh and turkmenistan you left with three countries so therefore only three is the correct answer for this particular question and recently the shanghai cooperation organization is also in use because belarus became a new member of the shanghai cooperation organization right so because of that reason also uh, you know a new country belarus added to the list so because of that reason so belarus uh is also becoming part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a 10th member and these are the existing members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, India and Pakistan. In fact, India and Pakistan were become members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the year 2017 and recent addition being the Belarus and Belarus became the member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Right. So if you look into the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, all these are member countries of Shanghai cooperation organization and Iran also set to become the member of this particular organization so you can also go through the countries which have the uh, which are considered as observer states but now Belarus is going to become the member of the Shanghai cooperation organization because of Russia's strong support and apart from that you can also go through the dialogue partners in these countries there are different dialogue partners also for the Shanghai cooperation organization and Turkmenistan is actually one of the dialogue partner of Shanghai cooperation organization but it is not the member of this organization now today also i have a given very very simple question so this question is simple question but very important question the question is central pollution control board cpcb it is a statutory organization and it is considered or constituted under which of the following legislations right so the question is central pollution control board is statutory organization constituted under which of the following legislations the options are environment protection act 1986 wildlife protection act 1972 water prevention and control of pollution act 1974 and biodiversity act of 2002 so this is very simple question so try to answer this question in the comment section and i'll be giving you the correct answer in tomorrow's class now we'll start our discussion the first very important article that we are going to discuss is about the Zika virus surveillance, right? So Zika virus is one of the virus that actually transmits uh, from one individual to another individual through a mosquito bite, right? So therefore, uh, this article is with respect to Zika virus surveillance and the vector control, especially in countries or uh, heavily den densely populated countries like India. So Zika virus has been making news in recent times because why it has been making news? Because at least 15 cases including 8 pregnant women of Zika virus have been discovered in Pune, Maharashtra. So this is in fact very serious when uh, Zika virus infects pregnant women then the newborn child will uh, you know have a disease called microcephaly. Right. So newborn child will have a disease called microcephaly. So in this disease, the newborn baby's head would be comparatively or relatively smaller than the normal baby's head size. Right. So therefore, it is particularly a concern whenever we found Zika virus because Zika virus also a, a sexually transmit uh, transmittable disease. So therefore, Zika virus 
among the pregnant women is a serious concern and this 15 cases including 8 pregnant women have infected with this Zika virus and in Pune, Maharashtra, right? So in Karnataka, a 74 year old who had Zika virus also died. So because of, you know, number of cases of this Zika virus, it is particularly a concern to understand and what are the causes, symptoms of this disease, whether Zika virus uh, really has medicine or vaccines to prevent such disease. So it is very, very important to understand about this. Now, when we talk about this Zika virus, oh, it is, uh, you know, an emerging virus and it also poses serious security, a serious threat to the uh, uh, health. So as per the World Health Organization, the Zika virus is a mosquito borne virus. Right? Zika virus is a mosquito borne virus and it was first identified in Uganda. So Uganda is an African country and Zika virus was first identified in Uganda in the year 1947. So where it was identified? So it was identified in rhesus macaw monkey. So in that particular monkey, Zika virus for the first time was identified. And in fact, followed by this identification of Zika virus, there is also evidence of infection and disease in human beings in other African countries also in 1950s. However, one thing that you need to understand, it was first identified in 1947 Uganda. So after identification, there were number of cases of Zika virus from 1950 onwards in African continent. Now, when we talk about Zika virus, how it occurs? It occurs through the bite of an infected Aedes mosquito, right? So infected Aedes mosquito, if it bites any healthy human being, so it could easily transmit the Zika virus to a healthy human being. So therefore, we can say that this Aedes mosquito can also be a host of the Zika virus, right? So host are uh, the species which are actually transmits disease from one individual to another individual. Now, when we talk about Aedes mosquitoes, mainly Aedes aegypti is the mosquito which transmits Zika virus from one infected individual to another healthy individual. And most of these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes will bite human beings or healthy individuals during the daytime that you need to understand here, right? So this also transmits dengue and other chikungunya diseases also. Apart from Zika virus, this Aedes aegypti also transmits dengue and chikungunya to the healthy individuals. So therefore, the mosquito borne diseases is a particularly a concern for a country like India where we have a dense population, right? So apart from that, the sexual transmission of the Zika virus, that essentially means that a transmission from a one individual having sexual contact with a woman. So it would lead to the transmission of Zika virus from one individual to his partner. So once the pregnant woman infected with the Zika virus, there is also a chance of transmission from the mother to the fetus would take place. Right. So once the healthy pregnant woman infected with the Zika virus or contacted with the Zika virus from her partner, then there is also a higher chance of transmission of this Zika virus from mother to the fetus. Okay, so and transfusions of blood and blood products are other routes of transmission of this Zika virus. Now you can also clearly see in this image that the Zika virus is a disease and in fact it is one of the most serious and threatening emerging viral disease. And this particular disease is transmitted from the bite of an infected Aedes mosquito, particularly Aedes aegypti mosquito. So you can go through all the symptoms of Zika virus. How, how can we get to know that any individual is infected with the Zika virus? So if any individual having the following symptoms, we can say that that particular individual would be infected with the Zika virus. Now, most of the infected individuals with the Zika virus disease either remain asymptomatic, they don't show symptoms immediately or show mild symptoms. So these mild symptoms include fever, rashes, 
and conjunctivitis and body aches and body pain so these are the mild symptoms that are generally shown when any individual is infected with the Zika virus. And apart from that, a severe form of disease also requires hospitalization and you know fatalities are also very rare in this Zika virus. So death due to Zika virus rarely occurs but any pregnant woman being transmitted with the Zika virus, a fetus or newborn would face a disease called microcephaly and we will discuss about the microcephaly in the later part of this lecture. And in fact, when we talk about the medicine and a vaccine for the Zika virus, so as of now, there is no specific medicine and vaccine available to treat the Zika virus and Zika virus infection during pregnancy can actually cause infants to be born with microcephaly right so infants being born with a small head compared to the normal baby normal normal baby's head that condition is known as microcephaly and along with the microcephaly other congenital malformation also because of the Zika virus so therefore it is particularly a concern right so how it actually manifests most people who are infected with the Zika virus, they generally don't show or don't develop symptoms. Even if uh, people are infected with the Zika virus, they very often show milder symptoms as we have already discussed. So how can we diagnosis, uh, diagnose this Zika virus? So diagnosis of Zika virus can be done by just looking at the symptoms of an infected individual or diagnosis can also be done by doing a laboratory test. So through a laboratory test or through understanding the symptoms of the Zika virus, so we can actually diagnose the Zika virus and adequate appropriate measures have to be undertaken. So India's apex agency for diagnostic approvals recently confirmed that there was no approved diagnostic test for Zika virus as of now. In fact, Zika virus do not have a specific vaccine and also medicine and apart from that Zika virus also does not have any specific or proper uh, diagnosis technique as well. Right. So these are some of the symptoms of the Zika virus and how infants would be at the risk if a pregnant woman is infected with the Zika virus. So in fact, we need to understand the ill effects. So what are the ill effects of Zika virus? So this is very, very important here. Now, when we talk about the ill effects of the Zika virus, so if any pregnant woman infected with the Zika virus, right so a pregnant woman infected with the Zika virus can actually cause infants to be born with microcephaly and other congenital malformations so you can clearly see the head of the infant this uh, with respect to the normal baby and this is with respect to the a baby who is having microcephaly right for example uh, when any pregnant woman is infected with the Zika virus the infant baby would have a smaller head because the infant baby would have microcephaly and other congenital malformations so therefore because of that reason it is a very very serious threat and it also requires a serious medical and healthcare interventions and uh, in fact it could also cause uh, preterm births and even the miscarriages in the childbirth as well. Now, what is microcephaly? We have understood that Zika virus can cause microcephaly in newborn babies. Now, when we talk about the microcephaly, so it is a condition in which infant's head is smaller than what is typical for their age. You can uh, clearly see the difference between a normal baby's head and a baby's head uh, who is having microcephaly so therefore it is a condition in which infant's head is smaller than what is typical for their age group and apart from that so it can be caused by brain not developing properly so when brain not developed properly so it could also cause this particular you know this is also caused by the Zika virus now when we talk about the Zika virus infection it is very often associated with the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome also so Guillain-Barre syndrome 
also caused by the Zika virus and apart from that this neuropathy and neuropathy and myelitis in adults and children will also be caused by this particular zero Zika virus now so understand one thing that apart from the microcephaly among children so Zika virus also causes or Zika virus infection also associated with this Guillain Barre syndrome neuropathy and also myelitis in adults and children also so these are some of the other diseases so if any person infected with the Zika virus would actually get right now what is this Guillain Barre syndrome right so this Guillain Barre syndrome is a very rare condition and that actually causes a person's immune system attacks the peripheral nerves of the person so therefore that would be having a serious health complications on the children uh, on the individual because individual's own immune system would be attacking the peripheral nerves of the individual thereby the consequences would be much more harsher right so when we talk about the vaccine for this particular disease so as I have already told you that there is no approved vaccine for the Zika virus. There is no such proper treatment for the Zika virus and there is also no approved diagnostic techniques available for this Zika virus, right? So no vaccine is available and no, uh, you know, treatment as of now found for this Zika virus. And therefore it is very important that we need to prevent the spread of the Zika virus by creating adequate awareness among the people. So this is very, very important, especially a pregnant woman. Right? So in India, for instance, several companies are attempting to make a vaccine for the Zika virus. As of now, no company has come up with the vaccine for the Zika virus, medicine for the Zika virus. Rather, whatever symptoms we have, those symptoms can be treatable, but specific medicine is not yet out in the market. In fact, a lot of companies try to produce a medication or vaccine for the Zika virus. So in 2017, Bharat Biotech published a study that is killed Zika virus vaccine, right? So in the study, Bharat Biotech uses the African strain that actually showed 100% efficacy for a Zika virus, right? So, you know, the African strain which was used by Bharat Biotech to manufacture or to make vaccine for the Zika virus. So that actually shows 100% efficacy against mortality and disease in animal studies. So therefore, it is a promising that Bharat Biotech is going to uh, manufacture or design develop a vaccine for the Zika virus but not yet developed and apart from that it is also very very important that Indian Immunological Limited right so Indian Immunological Limited so this is a wholly owned subsidiary of the National Dairy Development Board right so this is completely owned by National Dairy Development Board so it has said that earlier this year that it was also working on developing a vaccine for the Zika virus. So therefore, it is expected that within one or two years, we can also, you know, develop a vaccine for the Zika virus and thereby we can treat this virus and its symptoms also, thereby preventing the potential negative implications of this virus, especially the microcephaly among the newborn infant babies because a serious health condition right so especially among the uh, newborn children this is a very serious health condition so that's all about the Zika virus and next important article is about the BIMSTEC so BIMSTEC is known as a Bay of Bengal initiative for multi-sectoral technical and economic cooperation right so that is the full form of the BIMSTEC BIMSTEC full form is Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. So if you know that we have SARC as a regional organization, right? So South uh, Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Now when ASEAN was established, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, it is a grouping of 10 countries, ASEAN became one of the most successful regional organization in the world right so when asian was set, uh, established 
the trade between all the 10 Asian countries significantly increased. A cooperation among all these countries also substantially increased, right? So learning lessons from the Asian, all South Asian countries, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, all other countries have established this SARC organization, right? So South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, particularly to promote intra-regional trade, intra-regional, intra-regional trade and commerce or intra-regional cooperation. So for that particular purpose, the SARC as an organization was created. However, the problem within the SARC organization is that India was a very big nation within the SARC grouping. And apart from that, all these South Asian countries very often have the bilateral disputes with each other. For example, uh, India, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka and India. Pakistan. So because of that reason, since many of these small countries have a lot of concerns with respect to India, especially we can say that the India Pakistan. So India Pakistan conflict or disputes very often shadowed the potential of the, uh, you know, this SARC regional organization. So therefore, BIMSTEC as a new organization was formed in this BIMSTEC total there are seven countries but Pakistan is not part of the BIMSTEC organization so therefore it is expected that BIMSTEC would be a viable alternative for the SARC and at the same time whatever regional cooperation that we wanted to achieve so we can achieve this through the BIMSTEC member countries right so we will understand what is big what is BIMSTEC and how many of uh, the South Asian countries are actually members of this BIMSTEC. So we'll understand everything clearly. First, we'll look into the context. The context is that a seven member, a Bay of Bengal initiative for multi-sectoral technical and economic cooperation should actually find solutions to the regional challenges. So recently, you know, a foreign minister's retreat was held. Right. A first foreign minister's retreat was held in New Delhi. And in fact, it is one of the first of its kind. So in this foreign minister's BIMSTEC foreign minister retreat summit, uh, external affairs minister S. J. Shankar held that BIMSTEC should actually find solutions to the regional challenges that the BIMSTEC countries have been facing. Now, in fact, when we talk about BIMSTEC countries, so all these countries are part of South Asia and these countries are also facing number of common challenges. For example, poverty is one challenge that these countries have been facing. Terrorism is another challenge. Terrorism is another challenge. Climate change climate change is another challenge ensuring environmental sustainability is another challenge low per capita incomes low levels of literacy and higher unemployment rates so all these are a major challenges that the bimstick countries have been facing so therefore in order to deal with all these challenges it is very important that bimstick countries they themselves find out solutions for the challenges that these bimstick countries have been facing that is what our external affairs minister uh, dr s j shankar has actually advised so when we talk about the developments in myanmar in recent times so those developments for example so myanmar is also part of the bimstick organization but the problem is that uh, a recent military junta has overthrown the democratically elected government. Now, uh, demo, uh, this military regime has taken over Myanmar's administration. But against this military regime, there were number of civilian organization they are fighting. So therefore, there was a, a civil war uh, like situation in Myanmar and right next to India's northeast. So therefore, this is particularly a concern. One thing is that that Myanmar is a key member of the BIMSTEC organization and second is that this civil war like situation would not be conducive for the growth and development of all these countries because the civil war would create instability and therefore it is very important that we need to find out a proper solution for this Myanmar issue right 
सो म्यानमार इश्यू एक्चुअली पोजेस अ मेजर मेजर चैलेंज बिफोर ऑल दीज बिम्स्टेक कंट्रीज बिकॉज म्यानमार मिलिटरी रिजीम और सिविल वॉर लाइक सिचुएशन हैज बिन क्रिएटिंग अ लॉट ऑफ इंस्टेबिलिटी एंड इन फैक्ट दर इज ऑल्सो बिकॉज ऑफ द म्यानमार्स इंस्टेबिलिटी a number of connectivity projects a number of developmental projects which were undertaken recently by the bimstech countries were also in question right so they are also not implemented properly because of the instability and violence in myanmar and in fact you know it is very important that we need to ensure stability in peace in myanmar so that whatever connectivity projects and developmental projects that are launched by these bimstech countries in active cooperation or in active association with the myanmar can be realized as early as possible and it is also very important to substantially increase cooperation such as trade commerce people to people ties with within all these bimstech countries so in this context what should be the india's role right so what role can india play in ensuring stability and peace in the region and further promoting trade and commerce between all these countries now when we talk about india's role so india has been very often focused on connectivity projects because we already have this india myanmar thailand trilateral highway right so it would be very important for india's act east policy particularly improving connectivity in the northeast and giving a lot of pillip to the economic growth and development particularly with respect to northeast because we very often see that uh, northeast is uh, economically backward region and there is also a poor connectivity also in the northeastern region so therefore this india myanmar thailand trilateral highway or connectivity project is very very important because it would connect india with the southeast asia and southeast asian countries are very well known for their manufacturing prowess and one way it would also ensures supply chain resilience for india supply chain resilient for india is very very important and along with the supply chain resilience for india so it also further uh, you know adds to india's act east policy resilience of india's act east policy or strengthen its ties with all south east asian and east asian countries and it would also substantially improves infrastructure in india's backward north eastern region so all these benefits are with the you know particular connectivity projects so therefore because of that reason india has been focusing on the connectivity projects and these connectivity projects are very important for the bright future of the bimstech regional organization and in fact india also exchanged its views over the broader stability peace and even the humanitarian assistance for the people who are living or who are facing a worst crisis due to the civil war now when we talk about the bimstech right so as i have already told you that in bimstech there are seven member countries and it is a regional organization bimstech is a a regional organization and in this bimstech there are around seven member countries right so this is a regional organization and there are seven member countries so those member countries include bangladesh bhutan india myanmar nepal sri lanka and thailand right so one thing that you need to understand when we talk about the sarc so within the sarc uh, you know this thailand is not the member country of the sarc right sarc in sarc thailand is not a member country and even uh, pakistan is also not pa pakistan is a member country of sarc but it is not part of the bimstech organization now when we talk about the bimstech few details with respect to bimstech is that uh, it has you know uh seven member countries right seven member countries and apart from seven member countries it was established in the year 1997 and when we talk about the bimstech it has a basic aim the aim was promoting a multifaceted technical and economic cooperation among all these bimstech countries within the bay of bengal region now most of these bimstech countries are located within the bay of bengal region so therefore the broad objective of bimstech is to promote a multifaceted technical and economic cooperation among the 
Bay of Bengal littoral countries. And few other details about the Bimstek grouping is that the Bimstek is home to around 1.5 billion people. And in fact, India alone contributes to around 1.3 billion people. And in fact, uh, as per the recent estimates, uh, total population of the Bimstek countries would be much more higher than the 1.5 billion people. And in fact, the combined GDP of all these Bimstek countries would be around or about 3.8 trillion dollars. So it would be much more than the 3.8 trillion dollars in recent times. Now, what are the basic features of the Bimstek Charter? In recent times, Bimstek has also developed its own charter. Now, what does it mean that any organization having its own charter? So what exactly it means? Now, when any organization have their own charter, so it would have an official standing as a legal entity. So it will be recognized as a, a legal entity whenever it has its own charter. And apart from that, it would also allow that particular organization to interact with other important international organizations such as UN, World Health Organization, European Union. So there are a number of uh, world organizations. So when it is given or when it has got the legal entity status, it is now allowed to interact with directly with the other international organization, especially on wide variety of matters such as diplomacy and cooperation in number of areas. Right. So therefore, charter of BIMSTEC giving it a legal entity status. And so therefore that enables BIMSTEC to cooperate with diverse countries. And in fact, BIMSTEC charter uh, very well outlined the objectives of this particular organization, right? So when we talk about the objectives, the broader objectives of the BIMSTEC grouping focus on building trust, friendly relations among the member states, right? So uh, the total seven member, uh, member states, the BIMSTEC charter will essentially focus on building trust and friendly relations between all these member states. So it would also substantially accelerate the economic development and social progress in all countries which are part of this BIMSTEC uh, in the Bay of Bengal region. So after that, the charter, uh, you know, for the BIMSTEC essentially means that it would now have a structured organization with a very clear framework, right? So it would, uh, you know, outline the BIMSTEC's operations, regular meetings, summits, ministerial and senior level meetings. So therefore, we can say that whenever it has a proper charter, the benefit or the advantage is that it would have a clear framework and an organized or well organized structure as well. So it would also substantially uh, expands the membership of the organization, right? So the charter paves the way for future growth by allowing new, new countries to join BIMSTEC and for other nations to participate as the observers, right? So other countries, uh, if they are interested in the functioning of the BIMSTEC grouping, they can also come forward and they can be, uh, they can become the observer status. And apart from that, uh, you know, BIMSTEC can also be expanded to include other important nations. So therefore, they could contribute positively for the growth of trade and commerce and cooperation between all these BIMSTEC countries. Now, we will briefly understand the significance of the BIMSTEC, especially for India. So it is very important for us to understand what is the significance of BIMSTEC for India, right? So we all knew that the new NDA government when Narendra Modi came to power in 2014, the look east policy was changed into the act east policy. And in fact, it is a more proactive policy from the central government to engage with East Asia and Southeast Asia. So BIMSTEC is a very important component of the government's act east policy, right? Because BIMSTEC is very often aligned with India's act east policy because this BIMSTEC actually helps gain trade and security prominence in the Indian Ocean region and uh, you know uh, the geopolitically geostrategically important Indo-Pacific region also and apart from that so BIMSTEC is very often considered as an alternative for the SARC organization right so in recent times SARC became uh, an inactive and inefficient grouping 
because of the bilateral disputes between different countries sark virtually became an ineffective organization and bimstec is seen as a replacement of the sark because uh, there were india's efforts previously to isolate pakistan at the 2016 sark summit right so at the 2016 sark summit so in response to the uri uri terror attack because very often the problem with pakistan is that pakistan has been promoting cross border terrorism and cross border terrorism is a concern for india and not just cross border terrorism pakistan has been directly and indirectly supporting radicalization and fundamentalism in jammu and kashmir so all these are a major concerns for india and therefore india has been trying to diplomatically isolate pakistan at the international stage and even in the regional organizations also but in this sark grouping pakistan is also one of the member so therefore from 2016 onwards india has been trying at its best to isolate pakistan from the sark like groupings so therefore bimstec is actually seen as an alternative or it has emerged as a a preferable regional cooperation platform as it has been offering alternative to sark in the south asia and apart from that uh, bimstec as a, a as a regional organization plays a very important role in promoting intangible culture right so it is very important that Uh, you know all these countries have a rich culture and heritage sark member countries especially not sark member countries bimstec member countries would come together and they would promote this intangible culture within themselves so there, were, there were initiatives also in the past like india's center for bay of bengal studies at the nalanda university it was recently inaugurated right so apart from that uh, you know this uh, india center for bay of bengal studies were established in bihar for research in art and culture and other subjects and it was also related to the bay of bengal and that can actually bring new insight and research in intangible heritage of the region right so all these countries have a rich uh, heritage and culture and bimstec would essentially focuses on further enriching and strengthening this rich culture and heritage among all these brick uh, bimstec countries now you can see uh, bimstec essentially as we have already discussed it is bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation so it was established in the year 2017 and total members of the bimstec organization uh seven countries and if you look into the basic objectives of the bimstec as a grouping so it would create enabling environment so that would facilitate rapid economic development and that would benefit all these big bimstec countries which are having common challenges with respect to economic growth and economic development and secondly it would also collaborate and mutually assist members on matters of common interest for example any country has been facing any issues then it would collaborate and mutually assist all other member countries in the matters of common interest and third it would also maintain close and beneficial cooperation with the existing international and regional organizations regional organizations also and to endeavor eradicate poverty from the bay of bengal region because poverty is one of the key challenge that all these bimstec countries have been facing and also to establish a multi dimensional connectivity and also to promote synergy among uh, the connectivity frameworks in the region so all these are the basic objectives of the bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation so next important article is with respect to the electric vehicle space or why the government has been promoting electric vehicles and what are the recent electric vehicle policies which are aimed at further giving a boost to the electric vehicle manufacturing and a faster transition into the electric vehicles on indian roads now why we are focusing on electric vehicles now when we talk about the conventional vehicles so what are the major problems with the conventional vehicles conventional vehicles uses fossil fuels right 
so they use fossil fuel as energy and the fossil fuels releases greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide into the environment and apart from that it would also contributes heavily to the pollution in cities like delhi and other important cities one of the major reason for the pollution was vehicular emissions so therefore each country is having their own intended nationally determined contributions as per united nations framework convention on climate change and it is also expected that all these countries would follow their intended nationally determined contributions to reduce global temperatures to below 2 degree celsius by 2100 and if possible all countries would reduce the global temperatures to below 1.5 degrees celsius by 2100 and now countries have been moving uh, making transitions into the green fuels at a faster pace essentially to ensure that the global temperatures would not increase uh, would not go around uh, beyond 2 degrees celsius by 2100 and in fact india is a country with a lot of ambitious targets we have been ambitiously developing the renewable energy and renewable energy related projects right so therefore apart from that we have also focusing or we are also focusing on electric vehicle manufacturing and faster transition into the electric vehicles because if you look into india india is one of the largest market for the vehicles so therefore we need to make a transition from existing fossil fuel based vehicles into the electric vehicles so therefore uh, you know our contributions or emissions into the environment atmosphere could be significantly reduced and pollution could also be substantially reduced and other thing that we need to understand that more than 85 percentage of our energy requirements are imported from other countries and when we developed uh, electric vehicles when we make a transition into the electric vehicles we can substantially reduces the cost of import of these fossil fuels from other countries so there are a lot of benefits for electric vehicles and because of that reason india has been increasingly focusing on electric vehicle space in recent times so we will understand the context of this particular article and then we'll proceed on to discuss this and recently government has been planning to expand its electric vehicle policy to introduce a retrospective benefits so retrospective benefits are those benefits which were not extended to the vehicles or vehicle manufacturers before so for example there will be a cutoff date for example we can say that the cutoff date would be 2022 for example government announces a policy on electric vehicles and government started saying that this policy would be applicable from 2022 onwards and it would not be applicable for any companies uh, which are producing these electric vehicles before 2022 so that that is what the electric policy uh, electric vehicle policy says but when the government has been planning to apply this electric vehicle policy uh, the retrospective benefits so it essentially means that the companies which are manufacturing these electric vehicles making transition into the electric vehicle space so they can also get benefited from beyond uh, you know before 2022 also so therefore it would incentivize the entities that have already invested in electric vehicle space with a formal announcement would be expected in coming august by the government right so why government is considering extending the electric vehicle policy what are the reasons that government wanted to extend the uh, ev policy retrospectively so this is to include a retrospective effect so that is essentially means that extending benefits to entities that have already made investments in the electric vehicles so therefore we need to incentivize the companies and firms which already invested in the electric vehicles so that we are actually rewarding them and intensifies incentivizing them uh, and also encouraging them uh, in the EV space right so especially in the EV sector and it would also encourage the global players as well because now when we talk about the electric vehicle segment it is one of the most uh, potential uh, sector and it is also one of the emerging sectors so therefore the policy seeks to promote global players to localize production and invest in the domestic ecosystem also right so for example we need to talk about tesla 
so tesla is one of the a key player in the uh, ev segment and government has been making a lot of efforts to attract tesla into india or uh, make tesla invest in india so therefore such policies would of course attract such uh, firms from other countries to come establish the manufacturing basis and you know invest in india so because that would create a lot of employment opportunities and electric vehicle cost would be significantly uh, lesser and it would also aid india's efforts to faster transition and consumers can also afford these electric vehicles because if they have their manufacturing basis in india so comparatively the cost would be significantly lesser so therefore this move would also encourages the global ev players to come and invest in india and in fact this would extend inclusive incentives for all the investors in the ev segment right so earlier entities were eligible for incentives only if they set up local facilities within the 3 years of receiving approval right so when we talk about the incentives which were extending to some eligible firms so only uh, those entities if they set up their local facilities within the 3 years of publishing this particular ev policy would be given incentives right so but the extension aims to make these incentive more and more inclusive so that essentially means that more entities would be included in this policy incentive segment more companies would be rewarded so that that incentivizes the companies to invest in the electric vehicle segment so when we talk about the electric vehicle policy in india so what should be the electric vehicle what was the policy of electric vehicles as of now in india you all knew that we have faster adoption and mobilization of manufacturing of electric vehicles policy right so this fame policy is known as faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles so that is a scheme and in fact it is one of the flagship scheme that uh, government of india has launched and this would incentivizes electric vehicle adoption and also the faster uh you know transition into the electric vehicles from the fossil fuel energy based electric vehicles so earlier there was fame one policy and now we have been implementing fame two policy right so the fame two current phase policy has been providing certain incentives for different electric vehicle segments for example so uh 15000 rupees of incentive per kilowatt uh with respect to two wheelers or up to 40 percentage of the vehicle cost would be provided as a in, uh, as an incentive under this fame 2 policy and apart from that a uh, 10000 rupees per kilowatt for three wheelers and four wheelers and this is also an incentive under the fame policy or electric vehicle policy in india and 20000 rupees per kilowatt for electric buses so these are the incentives that the fame 2 policy has been announced with respect to the different vehicle segment and therefore this would incentivizes and also encourages the consumers to purchase electric vehicles and it would also aid in faster transition from the existing fossil fuel based vehicle vehicles to the electric vehicles and apart from that the government of india has also launched this phased manufacturing program now when we talk about this phased manufacturing program so this was launched to essentially boost the local manufacturing capabilities with respect to the electric vehicles right so the government has implemented started implementing this phased manufacturing program so that gradually increases the import duties on the electric vehicles and electric vehicle components over a period of time so therefore when government increases import duties on electric vehicle components so that would substantially incentivize the domestic production right so one thing that we need to understand here so whenever we wanted to protect our domestic markets so it is very important that you know a protection of domestic markets domestic markets protection so in that case it is very important that we need to curb imports right so protection of domestic markets with respect to the electric vehicle components 
so if that is the case and if government is committed to protect domestic markets we must curb imports from other countries because uh, if we allow imports then it would uh, you know certainly cripple down the domestic electric vehicle components market so therefore one measure that the government generally undertake is increasing the customs duty on the electric vehicle components right so that would disincentivize imports of these electric vehicle components into india and that could revive india's domestic electric vehicle components market now when we talk about the new electric vehicle policy of 2024 right so this new electric vehicle policy of 2024 has a certain key highlights now what are those highlights so it would reduce the customs duty of 50 percent on imported electric vehicles so with a minimum cif value of $35,000. So again, for example, imagine that, uh, you know, uh, global players in the electric vehicle segment, they did not invest it in India, but they wanted to export their electric vehicles into Indian markets. Now, in that case, if an electric vehicle cost is less than $35,000. So in that case, customs duty was just customs duty is just 15 percent on that particular electric vehicle so this is essentially to make these electric vehicles more and more affordable for the indian consumers so that now they start adopting electric vehicles and that would reduce emissions and also reduces the uh, pollution also and in fact for any global player the cap of uh, you know exporting electric vehicles into indian markets per year is 8000 vehicles per year into the indian markets so imagine uh, also understand though, the other thing is that these me measures that were taken by the government under electric vehicle policy is essentially to protect domestic automobile industry right because you know foreign uh, uh, auto uh, electric vehicle manufacturers they manufacture and they just import their electric vehicles into india so that would significantly impact the domestic automobile sector and these some uh, incentives or restrictions or concessions provided by the government under electric vehicle policy is essentially to protect the domestic automobile industry and in fact the government has also clearly set the requirement of manufacturers to invest at least 4150 crore or 500 million and also achieve 25 percentage of the domestic value addition within the three years escalating to 50 percent in the next five years right so there are also obligations on the global ev players to invest in india over a period of time so you just start investing in india because India is a, one of the big market for the electric vehicles. So therefore, first you invest around 4,150 or 500 million into Indian economy in the EV segment and 25 percentage of the total components should be procured from India alone. And over a period of next five years after the investment, 50 percentage of the total components should be procured from the Indian manufacturing firms. Okay, so this revised policy on electric vehicles align with India's goals of enhancing local manufacturing and technology adoption with respect to the electric vehicle industry. So it is very important that when we wanted to become self-reliant, so when we wanted to reduce our import uh, dependence on electric vehicles, it is very important that we need to develop a strong and a robust manufacturing base with respect to the electric vehicles. And we should also have a technology adoption. Right. So all these, uh, you know, uh, me measures that uh, all these provisions with respect to the electric vehicle policy of 2024 is essentially to uh, essentially enhancing local manufacturing and technology adaptation in the EV industry. Right. So uh, when we talk about this domestic value addition, right. So there were also norms of 25 percent in first three years and 50 percent in next uh, five years by f f uh, you know five years so what does this domestic value addition actually means so the electric vehicle policy of 2024 mandated that half of the value addition in the manufacturing be done domestically within the five years that is 50 percent within the five years so that could significantly or substantially boost the local manufacturing with respect to the electric vehicles and the other 
thing is that the Indian government also substantially reduced import duty from earlier 70% and 100% on these electric vehicles to now just 15% on the electric vehicles, uh, vehicles uh, which cost $35,000. So this is essentially to protect the domestic automobile industry and also encourage competition within the domestic automobile industry with the global players. Along with that, uh, any global electric vehicle manufacturer can import around 8000 vehicles per annum into India. So the government also wanted to strengthen electric vehicle ecosystem in India through this EV policy of 2024 by essentially focusing on strengthening the local production and local investment in the electric vehicles and this policy also aims to strengthen entire EV ecosystem in India because electric vehicles will be the future. Therefore, it is very important that we need to develop the manufacturing capabilities and we should also develop the technology with respect to the manufacturing of electric vehicles. Now, India has been importing these electric vehicles, but one day India should reach a stage where it would have the capability to export these electric vehicles to rest of the world. So that capability has to be achieved. So in order to achieve that capability, the electric vehicle policy should have a proper framework. So that would encourage manufacturing and technology adoption. So in fact, India actually aims to become a global leader in the electric vehicles, right? So positioning India as a leader in the global transition from internal composition engines to electric vehicles by fostering sustainable and technologically advanced manufacturing environment over a period of time. So these are the basic aims and objectives of the electric vehicle policy, right? So that's all in this lecture and thank you so much. So if you really like our work, please uh, like our video and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.